Welcome everybody here in the room and everybody who's joining us uh, online today. I'm David Skaberg. I'm Dean of Humanities here at UCLA and Senior Dean of the College of Letters and Science. And I'm delighted to be introducing another in another lecture in our lecture series, Possible Worlds. Possible Worlds is a series that stretches back in planning about three years. We began it uh, two years ago. In fact, we began during uh, the pandemic. It's a series that really brings together the mission of the Bruggen Institute and the mission of the university uh, in the place where these missions intersect. And that's a place where, as the Bruggen Institute has indicated in, in its, its messaging, where ideas matter, where we understand that in reckoning with the most serious problems that face us today, the problems that promise to become more serious and more challenging in the future, what we need to be able to do is talk with each other on the level of ideas. Ideas about the future of humanity, ideas about the future of democracy, ideas about the future of technology. In short, the ideas about how we're going to succeed in living together successfully in the coming years and decades. We've had the opportunity to invite a number of very inspiring speakers, thinkers on matters of justice, on matters of environment, on matters of communication, um, some of the first speakers in the series have been the political theorist Danielle Allen, the architect Alejandro Aravena, and the author Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, I would now like to yield the podium to Don Nakagawa, who's the executive vice president of the Burgoyne Institute, to introduce today's speaker. Hi, everyone. Thank you, David. Um, so I'm Don Nakagawa from the Bruin Institute. Um, as I think the name of this lecture series implies, um, and, and David talked about a bit, we see our, our mission at the Institute to really try to <coughs> invent the future, I suppose. Uh, not alone, obviously, it's a pretty big task. Um, but we see the future, and I say that with some trepidation because my own belief is that it's not so much the future, it's the present we can't see quite well right now. And we can't see it because we're living in an institutional architecture that's from another time and not really built for the time we're living in. And a lot of us suspect it, right? We feel it. It's all around us all the time where these risks can continue to mount and no matter how many proclamations, agreements, treaties, or whatever we broker through our institutions, we don't seem to be making headway against them and they continue to get worse. And that's, I think, our biggest indication. But we don't just, at the Bergen Institute, study the future because there's this massive threat landscape. We also think that there's incredible opportunity in front of us, right? With science and technology and what we're learning, um, the opportunity space to actually create a different future has never been better. And our ability to see ourselves and our relationships to each other and the planet and therefore organize ourselves in entirely different ways is going to be exponentially better over the next coming decades. And we're really fortunate that that's happening <laughs> because at the same time, this, this, this um, threat landscape that we're facing is existential and it is a product of the system we're living in very much. So at the, at the nexus of those two things is where we spend a lot of our time trying to envision what the future could be and trying to create systems, institutions, and new ideas around which to build those, uh, those systems and institutions that will give us the future that we're looking for and the future we want. So um, lofty goals um, and very exciting work and exciting time to be doing this kind of work. And so why does that bring us to Daria? Um, so we have Daria Isaacson here with us tonight. She is the Director General of Nivinova. And uh, I think it, what's, what's really exciting about the work they do there for me personally is two things. One, the only parallel we have to this uh, agency for innovation the, the, in Sweden is DARPA and it's a really poor parallel I mean it really it does exercise you know uh, its primary goal is really national security and defense it reports into the DOD and it is a really I think apt reflection of our priorities as a, as a country unfortunately um, in which we invest an enormous amount there at the expense of many other things Whereas the Swedish Innovation Agency really is looking out for the public good and trying to apply innovation principles to creating a better future in which Swedish society can thrive. I would love to have an innovation agency that was focused on that here in the United States. So that's super exciting. But in addition to that, 
the way they go about their work, I think, is something that we can learn from. And I'm hoping Daria tonight will talk a lot about not just the orientation of their work, but how they go, what their theory of change is, and how they use um, a broad and, I think, quite ambitious collective collaboration process to come to their solutions. So I will leave it there, and I'll give the podium back to David. But thank you, everybody, for being here, and I really hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much, Don. So word on format for, uh, for this evening's talk. Uh, directly following Daria's remarks, we'll, we'll welcome uh, Professor Tobias Higby uh, to moderate an interview with, uh, with Daria. Um, professor Higby is a professor of history and of labor studies, and he's chair of the program in labor studies here at UCLA, also associate director of the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment. During this part of the program, we'll look forward to taking questions from the audience, that is to say after the formal remarks are done and as the moderated remarks begin here on, on stage. So at this point, I'm very happy and very proud to welcome to UCLA, Daria Isaksan. Thank you for a generous invitation and a super generous uh, introduction, I have to say. Uh, thinking that Dr. can learn from us was we learn from them as well in terms of innovation challenges and other things. So but for now, let's see, am I getting this right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm delighted and honored to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure. And actually, I'm looking forward almost the most to the dialogue after where I'm hoping to get, you know, to hear your stories and your questions. But in order to get to that juicy part, I'm asked to give some you know, reflections and examples on innovation in Sweden. And of course, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, let me start with, I'll start here. Um, right. Saying a few things about my, I'll tell you something about myself, if it works. Um, I wasn't always director general of the innovation agency, obviously. Uh, I grew up here in the north of Sweden. If you would have asked me at the time, I would have said, no, this is not the north. You can go so much further up north. But for any practical purposes and for anybody looking outside, uh, yeah, I grew up in the very north. And when I did, my main, I loved snow, books, and art in that order. However, since there's this long story of public-private collaboration in research and innovation in Sweden, I was raised by a dad who worked as an engineer at the state-owned telecom research center up there. So I also grew up in a house where there was a sort of a late 80s, early 90s makerspace. Imagine a room that you enter filled with little red boxes uh, on the walls with little condensators and resistors inside. And if you wanted respect and quality time from my dad, that's where you should be soldering electronics and programming. So I somewhat reluctantly did until one day when I was about 13 years old, my dad let me solder together an optical sensor, one that notices if you break the beam of light to my cassette deck player so that anybody who would enter my room would hear my recorded voice say, get out of here. <laughs> That experience was life-changing for me because suddenly it was fun. I realized I can create experiences that has an impact on people if, from my ideas. So that made a huge difference. But then you can imagine being a girl with that kind of attitude and that kind of interest profile, not so many friends. So a few years later, my father introduced a modem to me in 1991 making it possible for me to have a BBS, dial up to other people's BBSs get access to the internet, internet relay chat, where I could discuss politics with conservative middle-aged men from Texas. <laughs> Another mind-blowing experience. Um, it was amazing. It was so different from anything I had ever experienced before. It's like the world opened up in all its messiness, right? So from that point, this was really driving me. And I used to have a lot of discussions with my dad. I wonder what the world will be like when internet access is as you know, taken for granted as access to electricity. Well, now we've all lived in that society for some time. And I think we all agree that it's complicated. Ah, so that's where it started. Why am I mentioning that? Well, 
fast forward a couple of years, I'd spent a little bit more than a decade as an entrepreneur in the space of digital and product innovation. And the prime minister asked me to join something that he had start, wanted to start called the Swedish Innovation Council. The Swedish Innovation Council was a council where the prime minister, the vice prime minister, the minister for research and education, the minister for business and innovation would sit together with 10 advisors, leaders in academia, uh, for instance, the professor Johan Rockström at the time leading the Stockholm Resilience Center, leaders from industry, venture capitalists, unions, and me. Now, in a Swedish context, that kind of group of people coming together to work and collaborate, uh, it's not that weird. Uh, it's actually something we do a lot. So as I noticed before, uh, Public-private collaboration in research and innovation has been essential for things that have been good for us in Sweden uh, for decades. But also organizations working, employee, employers and unions working together is also kind of typical, um, at least since 1938, because that's when these guys signed something called Saltrebaden av Talet. So what you're watching, seeing on this picture are leaders for organizations representing employers and leaders representing unions. And they agreed that in Sweden, wages should be cited through negotiations between these organizations, setting the framework for the collective kind of salary levels. And then individual uh, salaries are set at the organization level. And that's a model that's been in place since then. It's called the Swedish model. And it means in essence that we don't have laws for minimum wage these negotiations kind of set the bar. It also means that most organizations, especially mid-sized to, to bigger companies, uh, in them unions are typically very well represented. So a good example would be the, the agency Vinova that, that I'm leading. I sit down once a month together with my head of HR and my COO and union representatives to discuss uh, relevant topics related to skills or work environment, or you know, threats and opportunities for us as an organization uh, for the well-being of the organization as a whole, which is important for us. They're also represented at our board. And I think that we all from experience know that this gives us a richer outlook on the society that we're serving and better perspective on the decisions that we're making. And this type of collaboration has also had an impact on policy. So if you look at Sweden, Typically, just like the Nordics, we are rated as countries with a good life quality. So we're ranked as one of the best countries in the world to be a child in or to raise a family in. So for instance, everyone in Sweden is eligible for 480 days of paid parental leave, meaning 18 months, shared 50-50 between the two parents. Nine, you, can, you can give your days away if you like. 90 days are only for you. So that means that Swedish dads are by now actually taking more than a third of that whole parental leave, which of course has an impact on the quality of their relationships and the opportunities as a family, as well as workplace opportunities for many. Um, as a country, we like to think of ourselves as lagom. Lagom is a word that means moderately, adequately balanced. Right. <laughs> or maybe so, you know, even compromised that it's a bit cowardly how much we stick in the middle. But that might not be true, because if you look at this, at least this way of looking at the world in a in a world value survey, we're the extremists up in the upper right corner. So I don't know. From our perspective, we're so long on. From your perspective, maybe not. You'll have to tell me later. Um, so what do you think about when you think about Sweden? I imagine scenery with lots of trees and lots of snow and lots of water. You're nodding. Well, that is true, of course. Um, and we have used these resources naturally to build uh, strengths. So for example, uh, we, only have, we are 1% of the world's forested area, but we are the world's second exporter. Uh, world's second largest exporter of pulp, paper, and wood products. And of course, we use this to innovate. So for instance, uh, we're experimenting with building skyscrapers all in wood that are working as effective carbon sinks. Or, and that, by the way, challenges regulation even in Sweden, so we have to deal with that. 
um, or uh, building windmills also based on wood or using the same raw material to create innovative textiles that can be sustainable alternatives to cotton are just a few examples of the kind of innovations that we do on this. Now, all these types of innovations create opportunities, but also challenges for existing value chains, for norms and regulations, you name it. So in order to take the opportunities we have, we need to innovate also institutionally. I'll come back to that. I'm giving you this example to give you one picture. This is one area where Sweden is strong, but we're only 10 million people. That means basically we're one city from a global perspective. And yet we have a wide, uh, a broad width of successful multinational companies, some with a hundred years history, some with a 10 year history, going from Ericsson in telecom, Ikea and H&M in retail, AstraZeneca in life sciences, Volvo, Scania in transport, Spotify, Mojang, etc. Um, a few years back, when looking into unicorns per capita, the Swedish startup ecosystem was second only to Silicon Valley in the world. So, and we are also the European leaders on impact startups. We're seeing a lot of investment into startups that are actually at their core to, uh, well, improve society in general and the world. So it's not all about industry. Many of these companies actually uh, are in the creative industry space. So for instance, there are only three countries in the world that are net positive music exporters, the US of course, UK and Sweden. And still music isn't our biggest export, but games from companies like Mojang, King uh, and others. Now, that's not bad, right? For a country that used to be one of the poorest and most unequal countries as late as in the late 1900s, because that's where we were. So we do sometimes get the question with such a small population and with that kind of you know, history, what's the secret recipe? And I'm one out of many who would tell you, most people would tell more or less a similar story. I think you should ask some of the other people in the room, but here's a few things. Early and ambitious investments into infrastructure, physical and digital. Um, a long-term commitment to invest in research and innovation. So as a country, we invest 3.3% of our GDP in research and innovation have been doing so for a long time. So we're number four uh, on a global rating and also making a significant in, uh, effort to make sure that we can draw on all the best talent in our country, regardless of background or gender, we need it. 10 million people, all the talent we, we have, we need to put to use. And then of course, some things that were maybe, well, I'll give you an example then of what this meant. So in the nineties, we had policies saying, this was early to mid 1993 to 95. We need to make sure that every resident in Sweden has access to broadband and a PC. And as many entrepreneurs in the digital space would tell you, that's how it started. Right, getting access to this technology, regardless of socioeconomic background. And then some things that were perhaps not so much by design. So when TVs entered the homes in the 50s and 60s, we could not afford to have a lot of national content. We're not France, we're not Germany, we're not UK, we're a small country, so we had to import. We could not even afford to dub it, enter subtitles meaning everybody born in the 60s and 70s and onwards have essentially been studying English while watching TV every day. And that has had an impact on lowering thresholds on the idea that you could actually get in touch with the ecosystem in Silicon Valley. And it, that has a huge, or just making it easier to collaborate across borders and language borders because you know English is important. So that's been good for us. And imagine how important it is for a, for a country with 10 million people. We do not have a domestic market. We need to think about export from day one in whatever we do. And we always have to be globally competitive or otherwise we just don't exist. But as most people would say, I think, we agree that one of the most important qualities that we do have that really helped us do this is this culture of trust and collaboration. That it's ingrained in us, no matter what sector, what industry, that we are good at working together, opening the door, talking to each other, regardless of level in hierarchy, regardless of you know, where you come from. So it does have a very important value for us. So, um, I'll give you an ex two examples of testament to that. Um, in our 
uh, we, we know we're funding something called AI Sweden, which is uh, a program for applied AI and industry, academia, also address uh, civil society and public sector. And when we have researchers coming over from the US, they're saying it's amazing that you get access to this detailed quality data sets from the companies that you're working with and that they are working with them together. That would not happen in many places in the world, right? Another thing is that the, nat the national innovation programs that Vinova runs, the research and innovation agenda, the priorities, the goals, the priorities for you know, what to do is typically set through collaboration between the different parties that set up that constitute the program. So that means even competitors are working together with the different government funding bodies and public sector. And then of course, the money goes out through open calls in competition and the ones taking part in these are a wide set of stakeholders, lots of SMEs, civil society, public sector municipalities and servants, it's more. So all of this sounds great, right? You're a country with no challenges. Wonderful, haha, <laughs> wish we could. Um, of course we have challenges as well. So for instance, increased inequalities in the country is decreasing trust, is decreasing a sense of you know, belonging to a bigger whole. It's challenging our opportunities to draw on all the talent, best talent that we have. Um, we're a welfare state. You don't need insurance. You get the same healthcare regardless. <laughs> um, but it's wonderful that science and innovation has made us live so long. You know, things that would previously kill you doesn't kill you anymore. That's great news. However, from a welfare economic perspective, it gets complicated <laughs> because when you live long, you often do so with kind of complex diseases and it gets expensive. So we know that we cannot, you know, we can't fund it. We can't even hire the nurses we need <laughs> in this demographic shift to have a sustainable welfare if we keep working the way we do right now. Um, so we understand we need to shift from a healthcare focus to a health focus. We need to put much more emphasis on prevention, on healthy lifestyles, and then ta-da, suddenly you need to start talking about city planning, about active mobility, about healthy food, about a lot of things that were not really in the discussion before. Um, and yes, we're part of, you know, human society responsible to address the fact that we are all working towards hard deadlines now. These deadlines are set by the planet. We can't negotiate with the planet. It doesn't care about our willingness to invest or change or innovate. We have to adapt. We have to transform every value chain, every city, every consumption pattern to lie within these planetary borders. And we need to do it in a socially sustainable way. That means, in effect, that science, innovation, and markets need to be directed to solving these challenges. It also means uh, that it has huge implications on things like um, what do we even perceive as a good life or institutional innovation? What is the role of government if the transformation needs to happen this fast? Talking to industrial leaders, they're saying the technology we're now in, uh, applying is better. It will win regardless. But we need to make sure it wins in a decade, not the four decades that it would take otherwise. So how do we work together to make that happen? Well, as uh, Dawn mentioned, we are the Swedish Innovation Agency. This is what our task is, uh, how it's formulated by government. It's our task to promote sustainable growth through funding needs driven research and develop effective innovation systems. Now it's interesting, in previous time, up until just recently, an effective innovation system was just supposed to be competitive, right? What is an appropriate definition of an effective innovation ecosystem for a generation tasked with this level of transformation? That's the important question for us. What kind of knowledge and research can we draw on in filling that task? So we've been really motivated to follow closely, for instance, the work of Mariana Mazzucato, who talks about mission-oriented innovation, about how to create directionality in work, not through top-down, you know, pushing it top-down, but creating directionality, giving the opportunity. How do we, between stakeholders in politics, in municipalities, the civil servants, with industry, with academia, how can we formulate relevant, tangible, ambitious societal outcomes to work, to strive towards? 
There are examples. In the US, you have the Apollo uh, time, right? A man to the moon and back. It's a great example, mobilized a huge part of the uh, US economy, albeit a bit pretty technical uh, challenge, but still. And it created innovation in all kinds of sectors and places, right? In Sweden, we have something called the zero death vision in traffic that has mobilized innovation in all kinds of places and actually accomplished great results. But um, so this has been important for us. Uh, missions oriented innovation is now being encouraged, explored, and implemented at scale by the Euro uh, European Union in Horizon Europe, which is the world's biggest research uh, program uh, right now. And that's what we want to do. So we were drawing on, and I was really thrilled when Mariano uh, accepted to be an advisor to Vinova because we wanted to make sure that we would pilot this on the ground as soon as possible. So that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years. I'd like to tell you a bit about it. Um, we were drawing on experiences from research and innovation programs we had been running for a decade in spaces like social innovation, uh, challenge-driven innovation, norm-critical innovation, where we had you know, built a relevant portfolio of great examples of, for instance, um, police, municipalities, schools, civil society, and companies working together to uh, provide individual support and have increased trust in society from uh, young people at risk of becoming criminal, essentially, supporting them, supporting their families so that they wouldn't, or um, meaningful activities for vulnerable kids or stimulating entrepreneurship in underrepresented groups. By the way, one of the most evidence-based best ways to increase innovation capacity in a society. So we had a portfolio, we have lessons learned also about the institutional barriers to this type of innovation. Um, barriers that we were trying to address through new tools, such as innovation procurement or social impact bonds, and then capacity building and people who could provide support, knowledge, etc. So we had done a bit of work, but then coming into this model then we need to apply some of these lessons in a missions oriented framework, meaning creating directionality through these tangible and relevant goals. Then looking at that goal from a systems perspective, identifying where are the angles or the intervention points that together could make this whole system tip over into another mode, meaning we know that we can no longer be part of a paradigm that, you know, for technology driven paradigm with supply of new solutions, because it's not going to be enough. We all know technology is not enough. We have the knowledge, we have the technology is not being implemented fast enough or in a, in a relevant way enough, etc. We need to also address demand side, things like not only demand that we can stimulate in terms of public procurement, but demand in terms of norms and behavior for future demand. How can we get to that? And how can we also very effectively work on the institutional barriers in terms of legislations or rules that are in the way for the new solutions that we need? How can we get new tools addressing that? And perhaps even most importantly, how do we develop the practice of creating opportunities for engagement from the people that need to drive this change and on different levels? Um, so I'm really happy that we had a lot of, you know, positive response in this uh, endeavor. So the government had four uh, strategic partnership programs that have been running for a couple of years, and we were um, given the task to kind of facilitate those dialogues and those working groups. And that gave us opportunities to put this mission oriented work to practice at the higher highest level. So as you can see here, this is the Swedish former prime minister up until just recently. Uh, and the health minister, and they're working together with our director for strategic design, talking about these types of intervention points, saying, okay, so we need a mobility system that's both sustainable and promoting health, going fossil free and electric will not be enough. What are the other intervention points that we really need to address? So that's the discussion going on here. Um, and we've been piloting then on the ground missions in two areas, mobility and food. Meaning that when we now build a portfolio of innovation related to food, of course, we're funding research, uh, basic research in advanced research facilities such as uh, Max4, et cetera, but also applied research uh, for these industries and helping innovative companies that can come up with innovative foods that are sustainable and healthy, et cetera. Of course, we do that. 
but we also bring them to the table to other government agencies that have not really understood the value of innovation, but have important roles to play in terms of food. So for instance, here's the innovative company that is providing land-based uh, algae that is really good for you, and then land-based um, fish. But the regulations told them that they had to slaughter fish as if they were cows. That didn't make any sense. So we bring them together so that they can remove the barriers faster. But more importantly, we looked at a sustainable healthy food system from a systems perspective. And I'm sorry, it seems like you can't really read it now, but identifying these different intervention points or angles that together could flip the system. And there are many here. So uh, circular zero waste systems, uh, traceable trusted produce, um, micro mobility ties into all kinds of different systems as well, if you want this to make it happen. And then we started deliberately designing projects that could pilot new ways of working. Uh, explicitly in this case, we work with a number of municipalities and their schools to make sure that when they procure food, because all kids go to school and eat, and that there's a lot of food uh, every day. So make sure that they are procuring from local and sustainable uh, producers so that they get a chance to grow. It's kind of creating a little bit of a new market because it hasn't been, uh, the system doesn't look that way today. And then taking these foods and including it into the educational curriculum so that the kids get opportunities to learn about the correlation between food and their health, uh, that they get a chance to try foods that they typically would not try out at home because we're kind of messing with the food culture in Sweden. We need to take steps here. Uh, and at the same time, uh, yeah, try and at the, so you get the municipality and the local companies and the teachers and the kids working together to see. And then of course the municipalities sometimes had to stretch their procurement policies to make this happen. So this is the kind of deep demonstration that we could do to have a number of layers, behavior, innovative companies, regulation policy, et cetera. And it could scale very quickly. So we tried it in a couple of different municipalities and then it could scale quickly. Um, we're working also on cities in a number of ways. Um, there's a strategic innovation program. We have 17 of those, one called Viable Cities. It's run by researchers in sustainable, um, urban sustainable uh, researchers in, at KTH. They're, gather, they're bringing together, oh, what do I wanna say? Sorry. The Swedish government has mandated all Swedish cities to become um, climate neutral by 2045. The ones who can move faster needs to move faster. So this program uh, is joining the 23 most ambitious municipalities, providing them with a platform to get connected to the Horizon Europe mission, because from there, there will be a lot of funding and support for ambitious cities in Europe. Two, giving them a platform to learn from each other, really building a culture. We have mayors on stage talking about their failures so that they will learn from each other faster as well as talking about their successes, of course. And then this program is, of course, a re, uh, an innovation program. So there's also funding from the experiments that they do. And all in all, from a portfolio perspective, making sure that there's a balanced portfolio of experiments that, can, you know, that they can learn from uh, each other. One thing that I find is interesting is the city that is locking their carbon budget to their uh, fiscal budget and starting to use that for prioritization. And then this program is also linked to the national level so that uh, us, but four other government agencies, some funders, some with other tasks, have written a contract with a mayor in every city called the climate contract that has to do with committing to supporting each other in this transformation. So the city uh, gives pledges to their goals and we are promising to provide support from them, for them in any way that we can. And that forces us to, you know, sometimes there are overlaps and, Sometimes there are gaps between the government agencies do, and now we're putting people tasked with finding those uh, you know, gaps between organizational gaps and bridging them. And then of course the municipalities are actively working, nurturing a culture of collaboration, innovation, experimentation, and also really developing their practices and how to work together with the local community, um, not only in consultation phases, but active participation in innovation practices um, for instance, also in foresight work, uh, creating, uh, co-creating ideas of what uh, their future city could be. 
And in that space, we also did uh, a project that I want to tell you about together with the National <laughs> Center for Architecture and Design. So we, we identified one angle saying, what if every street in Sweden would actually promote health and well-being? Meaning a lot of things. It needs to be greener, it needs to be you know, active, et cetera. How could, could we find ways of, of quickly transforming every, every city? Um, so we piloted, it's both solutions, like a very modular solution that makes it easy to change the street from a car street to something else. Um, but it's, it's done in a way that the whole process of choosing the uh, functionality is done through a collabor collaboration process with the people actually living by the street. So we brought in kids from daycares, the kindergartens, <laughs> to be part of talking about what the functions should be. Um, and using that as kind of an idea of a platform, like how can you uh, engage uh, local people in and give them a little bit more of, um, uh, of a say about what their street and what their neighborhood should be like. And this was actually a project that's been written about in a couple of American magazines. So if you would Google Vinova streets, I think you could read about it more. Now, one of the things that I'm worried about time, maybe I'm talking too much. Um, one of the things that's really changing the conversation in Sweden right now is industrial transformation ga gaining speed. So the northern part of Sweden, where I used to live, isn't really the same anymore. The communities, uh, not by the coast, but in the country, have been declining for decades. So, you know, less people, uh, companies leaving, and now this is all changing. Why? Because some brave people, Martin Pei, for instance, he said, Oh, so much research saying we can't produce fossil free steel, we can't produce fossil free steel, but if I look at the lab results, we can. It just requires massive scale and loads of clean energy. So what will it take to do it? And he did kind of business side work and he went and they partnered up. So the Swedish steel company, SSAB, partnered up with LKB, the mining company, partnered up with the utilities company, Vattenfall, that have access to clean energy. And they said, let's do it. Let's just make the billion kroner investments in to try to really push and produce fossil free steel. It constitutes 10% of the carbon emissions of Sweden. The global impact, since we're a big exporter, is even bigger. So their effort will have a pretty fair impact on our emissions. So they did this and then things started changing. And at the same time, you had companies such as Northvolt saying, okay, so we have world-class research in batteries. We're leading the flagship effort in Europe. Uh, we have clean energy this would be a perfect place to start building really um, factories for really green batteries. So they are now pushing the limits, producing the world's greenest batteries. Um, but interestingly enough, all of this requires loads of energy. And yes, we do have a lot of clean energy, but not enough. Basically the scales we're talking about, we need to introduce one more country into the Nordic grid. That's a lot. And we need to do it really fast. So suddenly, tensions in society become really relevant. What does it mean to put up that amount of windmills to the Sapmi, our indigenous people who are totally dependent on large space of land for their reindeers, for their uh, ability to make a livelihood and to live according to their culture? How can we uh, manage that? Or even to the Swedes living in um, places like Kiruna, who now see that they have to move their entire city to be able to do the mining needed at this level. So in all of this, it becomes really clear that we need a lot of improved dialogue and collaboration, not only to negotiate kind of the solutions uh, in terms of you know, finding the right compromise, but to actually get even further, we need to have the nuance and the ability to have that kind of complexity so that we really drive engagement. We need to be able to create this type of future together. Um, so that's where I'm really happy also that we are, for instance, getting tasked by government to help facilitate those processes in a new way. So we're going from consultant <laughs> events to um, co-creation processes, if you will, where we have stakeholders really participating in defining the problems and defining the opportunities as well. So uh, ask me in a couple of years if we managed. 
um, but it's it's nice to see what's happening. And then, of course, you know, these societies that used to be in decline, if you, they're saying now to us at the government level, you know, if you would have told us company X is uh, closing down, everybody would know what to do. You know, you're losing 3,000 jobs. Everybody knows what to do. What are we going to do now when a company comes and say, we're going to hire 10,000 people in a couple of years? Ah, uh, new type of challenge. But the kind of challenge that it brings hope, right? That when we really start doing this transformation, it creates a completely different type of challenge, finally. Um, but then, of course, we need to, uh, the municipalities are understaffed, under-equipped, saying we need to build and build fast, and we need to do, we want to do it with quality. We want to create attractive societies where people want to live so that we can attract, you know, talent from other countries, all the people that we need here. But that means radically redesigning, changing the local community. So you need to start engaging the local community in what will it be like? What do we want it to be? What do we have to offer? So for that, we made a call uh, that is now, uh, I think there are 11 teams, architects, city planners, poets working together on uh, together with the local communities in terms of you know, yeah, other types of artists as well. And what can we do? What is it going to look like? What, what kind of um, local community do we want? So these are a few examples and I'm really proud and it was by chance, by the way, that it was only today that we published a book where we are presenting some of the lessons learned and the work practices that we've had. It's pretty detailed descriptions of what to think about and how we ran these kind of um, processes. And we're doing that because there is no silver bullet. There is no perfect process. There is only practice. We have been practicing for three years. We learned a lot. So many people contributed, but we're hoping by publishing this that we will get a lot of people coming back to us, telling us about their experiences and their lessons learned and how to tweak and evolve it even further. So I'll finish up by saying this, because I know that many of you come from the humanities. Um, we need so much more. Um, I think that we're a generation that, you know, we have never had to cross so many silos in society ever before. And I think the people in humanities are, humanities are often uniquely equipped, uh, both with the capacity for reflection, a lot of knowledge, strong skills in narratives and storytelling, things that we need. So you guys are the ones who can help us bridge over time, past, present, future that we really need. You can build bridges between perspectives and disciplines. And that's what we really know, mean. We need uh, places and opportunities for real experiences, for the kind of transformational le learning that you know, research is telling us needs to happen in order for us all to have this change paradigm shift in the way we act together. So I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much. And uh, do ask questions, but even more, tell me about your experiences. Thank you. I've got a few questions, and uh, we have questions from the audience. And there's an online audience, as well as a in-person audience. So um, at some point, we will, we'll, if you have a question here in the uh, in-person audience, you can raise your hand, and, and I'll moderate that. And if we get things from the online audience, Someone will come and ask that question, I'm, I'm sure. So uh, there's so many things that uh, you're, you're, first of all, thank you so much. And thank you for coming to California. Uh, how do you like California so far? <laughs> oh, is that a question? It's wonderful. <laughs> it's the first time I get to present uh, physically during the whole pandemic. It's a thrill. You have spring. It's beautiful. It's one of the nicest campuses I've ever seen. It's, it's amazing and a privilege. Thank you. It's great to have you here. So, well, I'm going to kick this off by asking a kind of question. You know, Dawn, in her um, opening remarks, talked about the, the existential challenges that we're facing with climate change and, um, and, and how their organization is, is very much focused on that. And it made me think, as somebody who lives my life in a large bureaucratic institution like a university, that there's, there's frequently um, we're given these grand challenges. It's a common sort of approach that uh, to try to get us to get over our you know divisions inside the university. So the grand challenges almost always come down from on high, uh, you know, and we receive them 
from the, the folks who clearly know better, uh, apparently, because they have like the system, there's like a shop somewhere on campus where they build grand challenges and <laughs> roll them out to the rest of us. Um, I, but uh, so what I'm fascinated is because these grand, when grand challenges are rolled out from on high and are sort of defined from on high, um, they, they don't, they tend to peter out the, the process. So I'm really interested in this way that you approach innovation and challenge with a capacity building perspective and in particular building capacity at the grassroots um, and so could you say a little bit about how you do that how do you build capacity for change among ordinary people everyday people uh, in Sweden who can take some of these challenges up and, and uh, own them themselves? Oh, that's a, it's a good question. Thanks. So, well, first of all, I don't know, we have the great challenges at university level too, actually. I just have to reflect on that. So, uh, I was part of uh, evaluating one of them at Gothenburg University. But it would typically never be a top down process, it would typically always be like a, an open call and then the most competitive ideas and, you know, uh, groups would win uh, and get their center eight-year uh, opportunity to make a difference. So I guess in general, I don't know, um, and I, I think I mentioned this much uh, previously, Sweden is a bit of a, we're small, but we're uh, immensely fragmented. So I think nobody has the idea that they can top down anything. You always have to kind of <laughs> build from the ground up in a way. Um, but how do we do it with ordinary people? I, we're trying, now we're, as a government agency, we still have limited funds. We could never reach every single person, so we have to work through partners and through building capacity of you know that. So in this sense, for instance, what we're doing is that we're working with cities, not with all, not with all municipalities, but the most forward-leaning, and then we're partnering her up with the organization that represents all the municipalities. Think of this, 10 million people, and still we manage to have over 200 of them. It's amazing. But um, so we work with the willing. So I think admissions works is a lot about working with coalitions of the willing. So we help and promote them, and then we look for places where you know, where where how can it scale onward? What are the mechanisms to to uh, help others uh, follow? So we typically do both: coalition of the willing to draw up the examples and the good pilots, and then look for where to spread it. Sometimes there are some capacities that aren't there at all, and then we fund. Um, we make a call and we try to fund something that can be the capacity. So in terms of social innovation, for instance, we had to do that. And uh, now it's working. Now there's a really strong network and they're promoting best practices and they're bringing all kinds of actors in. And it's really beautiful to see. So those would be two, two ways to do that. Great, thank you. And, and um, so I'm a labor historian, so I take use my chair's privilege here to sort of ask you. You mentioned that labor unions are involved in this in Sweden. And, um, I think it's fair to say in the United States that um, the general attitude in business is not would would not look kindly upon that. So, so for our American uh, business leaders, uh, what is it like to um, talk to labor leaders and labor union people, and what is the role of organized workers in in an innovation society? Well, I mean, my personal experience, I, in my company was at most, almost 100 people, so that's not really the same thing as talking to the industrial leaders. But I think that, you know, since it's, we have so much history in this, it's, you can have different opinions, um, mm -hmm. of course, because in negotiations, you typically don't agree from the beginning. It's just that we have so much experience of that it works, and it, it gives a good outcome, right? So I think everybody more or less trusts this way of working by now. Uh, so I guess that, I mean, what would my message be? And then of course we have a wide range of opinions about unions, but um, let me put it this way, I'm quoting a union leader now, for instance. Uh, we're not afraid of technology, we're afraid of old technology, because that's gonna harm our workers. Because the old stuff makes the companies irrelevant and unable to compete, and that's how we would lose jobs. So basically, we have nurtured a culture where everybody sees the value of change and the importance of change. And once you have that kind of trust, then it's more like a different perspectives on, on what it will take. <coughs> so in, in a sense, I guess that's, that's an answer. But you know, you should also 
ask the, the corporate leaders. Yeah. <laughs> I work for government. Well, I was fascinated by your, uh, you know, the description of the fossil free steel uh, development because obviously in the United States the, um, the steel industry is, has waned, you know, a lot, and, and there's you know massive overcapacity in steel globally. So, but the idea of, of creating a steel production facility that is not using a lot of coal um, is a remarkable concept. So is that something, you know, and it's, I don't think it's anything that anyone's thinking about here, to be honest. I could be wrong. There's any steel people out there. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I know when we were in Glasgow for COP26, there were some meetings with industry leaders from all over the world, definitely with Canada. Um, so I think that we're not by now the only ones working on it. I think that we were among the first. But what's interesting to see is that once they decide to make this kind of bet and investments, what it requires are really strong partnerships across industry lines because the steel producer cannot do this on their own. They need the partners in, in different other industrial sectors. So it's really they can't they can't go at it alone. That's why the CEO of Volvo was standing and there, I hear them saying the same words. It's like partnership is the new leadership. And then you see these different industrial leaders partnering up in, in new ways now to kind of push these things forward. And that's inspirational. That is, yeah. And and what's what is the role of the government for that? Because obviously, I mean, there must be some, uh, is it a coordinating role or are they dictating that this is going to happen? No, the government can't dictate what companies do. So <laughs> now it's definitely not a government thing. Um, but uh, yeah, one good example is, again, when you have these big shifts in technologies or whatnot, it does have an impact on what kind of skills and, and uh, in, you know, people need. Uh, so one thing that happened due to this is that, uh, again, the government uh, partnership program had one focus on skills and lifelong learning. So there you had universities, uh, unions, industrial leaders, uh, other actors as well, working for now a couple of years so now there is a plan and an agreement about how to you know what are the intervention points there what do we really need to do to to create opportunities for many so that we have the skills available that we need etc so i guess that's where government comes into play because there are many important roles for government to play so when when things are moving we need to make sure that the system supports the transformation um, another thing that's happening is we need to work differently with regulation because, as I mentioned, the time perspective this time is different than from previous industrial revolutions or, you know, other, as a historian could tell me more about it, but I hope we agree, we, things yeah. need to move a bit faster. Yeah, it needs to go faster, definitely. And, and then it's inspiring to see, so Canada, for instance, Germany, other countries, they also did uh, regulatory sandboxes as a concept. Uh, the EU implements that in relation to one of their uh, programs. And we are also uh, exploring that. So government is actively encouraging uh, agencies to be experimental, to take risk, to be innovative, uh, to work cross silo government agencies from that, from local to uh, national to international, and also to well not yet work outside of current regulation. But you know many government agencies are implementing and uh, in charge of implementing laws, right? So at least stretching the implementation to pave way. Uh, so that's another thing. So in terms of this, it means uh, please change the processes in terms of you know, coming to this, how to manage the permits, etc. cetera. Uh, build a process that encourages participation, bringing in stakeholder engagement, and do it as a process, not as a, just a consultation phase. So those are a few uh, examples of what government is doing that I think is really, it's, um, it's easy to be motivated to work for a government agency as well and get, get tasks, tasks like that. You know, when you're, you're describing the sort of um, culture of government, I mean, uh, it makes me think, I mean, we have massive challenges, obviously, across the United States, but just here in Los Angeles, that housing is a, 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 a big problem. Uh, there are tens of thousands of people living on the street. Uh, uh, several years ago, voters overwhelmingly voted to uh, tax themselves to fund housing, and yet nothing is happening, or, or appears that relatively little is happening, and people are frustrated with it, and it's now is becoming a political 
challenge, um, you know, with recall elections and other things like that. So what is listening, you know, so some of this innovative sort of uh, getting people together to solve problems across different sectors is really something that we could use. And I was especially noting at one point you were discussing, I think it was in the discussion about the if every street could be livable um, concept, which, um, which sounds really um, utopian to a person in Los Angeles, but uh, we need that, you know, we need these kind of utopian approaches. So I was, so one thing is just, it's amazing that you're doing that. So it's, it's cool, it's inspiring. I also noted how, um, how evaluation seemed to be embedded in the approach. So you have these kind of evaluation cycles, and um, I, I'm just curious how that actually works and to what extent that sort of uh, system of evaluation and forcing people to kind of confront their successes or failures uh, feeds into it, because in a typical political system, no one wants to be seen as failing because then they lose their job. But it's difficult to innovate without failing. Well, yeah, exactly. So I mean, there are different types of evaluation. Obviously, in terms of our programs, we both they are evaluated by external uh, actors. We don't only evaluate ourselves, and you know, we have hard metrics, etc. But the type of evaluation that we focus on is the one that is designed for learning and in an ongoing process, because that gives the most value moving forward. And uh, from that sense, I mean, what you're saying now is obvious, and we know that from all, I mean, you have the world's best innovation ecosystem in the US, and, you know, fail fast and forward was, uh, you can discuss that, but yes, being innovative means taking risk, it means acknowledging that you will not always succeed, in fact, you will quite often fail, <laughs> uh, but then you have to redefine the notion of failure, you have to talk about learnings, and learnings are always valuable. Failure without learning is useless, that was just bad. But if you bring it out and you talk about it and you learn from it, then it had value. It will help somebody else not do the same mistake, it will you know, help you connect the dots. So I think in, in all of these programs, really carefully and deliberately making sure uh, you do everything you can to make stakeholders feel safe enough to talk about what didn't go as planned uh, is a good quality, both in leadership and in organizational culture and in program design. So we're doing what we can. Not saying we're perfect, but yes, it's well, an important point. It, yeah, by definition, you, you're not perfect. You have to fail to, to innovate, yeah. So again, once again, if there are questions in the audience, happy to take them. Yes, sir. Okay, kind of dovetailing off that, in terms of the country and society as a whole, how do you encourage the kids to be innovative as they go through the education system? So I'm going to just re uh, repeat that so the audience online. Uh, the question is about how do you uh, encourage young people to be innovative as they go forward in society? So that's a really good question. And the reason I hesitate to answer is in what capacity am I answering now? But I guess I'm a mom, <laughs> you know, but I haven't been to school in that sense uh, as a kid for decades. Um, yeah, so it's, um, Sweden is not a very hierarchical country, it's a very, um, let's just say that expressing your mind, regardless of who's listening, is really actively encouraged in most places. Uh, it has pros and cons. So for some it would seem like our kids are allowed to speak their mind in an uncomfortable way. I think we try to raise them to be decent human beings, but it's a, I think it's a big part of our culture to just uh, actively listening and acknowledging opinions and stuff, so we help them. However, what we don't do, which you guys do, is uh, train people to be good at presenting ideas, for instance. That's something that we've been trying to learn uh, lately because it matters. Your ability to package and pitch ideas, for instance. Uh, so we're picking up things from you, but I think in terms of speaking your mind uh, and knowing that your voice is valued, uh, there are many ways to do it. Um, I know a person who, who did her doctoral thesis on uh, drama pedagogy and democracy, and she's implementing uh, her research in schools in terms of letting kids use their voice in singing and exploring that as a democratic right. But there are many ways to do it. 
There's a, another question from the audience that I'll share. Um, uh, this one comes from Raymond Chen. It is, how hard is it to ha have breakthrough innovation nowadays with a small budget? Can you give some examples? How was it accomplished? Yeah, oh, as a DG for innovation, maybe I should. I'm, uh, how hard is it? I really can't give a metric for it. I think the whole uh, notion of- Does it happen? You know, breakthrough innovations happen occasionally, but um, more often not, so is it hard enough? I don't know, frugal innovation is interesting, and I think that there are some opportunities for frugal innovations to have large scale impact, but I'm sorry, I, I can't give a really good example. Maybe the one who asked the question could, because it sounds like it, I would be curious. It could be, yeah. Well, there are, I, I believe they're in, in our online audience, so. Uh, but it is an interesting if question. If you have an example, please tweet it to me. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, the, it is interesting to think about sort of large budgets versus small budgets, right? Because there's a tendency, um, or, or this is kind of a, 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 you know, there's big science and obviously certain certain challenges in science can't be solved without huge budgets and super colliders and things like that. Uh, but some of the challenges we're talking about here, you know, getting people to talk to each other, envisioning a new society, um, respecting each other, um, theoretically at least, those shouldn't be terribly expensive and yet society has said, or well, you guys seem to be doing okay, but we're having a little trouble over here, despite the money we might be spending on it. <laughs> is there a question in there? Is that a question? Or is I could give a reflection, maybe, but no, but um, yeah, so if you look at the numbers from the people who are doing the research on what it takes to transform society into something sustainable, I think that the main message is yes, we're lacking some, uh, there's still knowledge we need, there's some, still some technologies we need, but we're nowhere even near, I mean, for this decade, we, we actually have all the knowledge and technology we need uh, to make the progress we need within this decade. Uh, so that's what we should be doing in order to buy us time for the stuff we don't have yet. So in that sense, the transformation we need is not about money. There's plenty of money. Uh, but it needs to be directed in other ways. So yes, the qualities and the dialogues matter. The quality and the priorities also matter. So it's been interesting. We've uh, funded a study on the European recovery funds in the aftermath of the pandemic. And it will be interesting to see how much of and these are huge investments. I mean, nations are now raising their uh, stats code, you know, the debt uh, a lot to to handle this. And there's a big difference if that money is being invested in, you know, legacy uh, solutions um, that keep bringing us in the wrong direction, and how much of it is actually directed towards the societal challenges and the solutions we need. So. Money isn't the problem, directionality of the money and the prioritization, I would say. So in that sense, uh, it could be, yeah, we can look at the numbers on how much we're fund, uh, subsidizing fossil fuels in the world, etc. I think we all know this. If we could just uh, withdraw those fossil fuel subsidies, we could probably sponsor some discussion groups. Yeah, but I mean, at, at the same time, I, I think, you know, I have to look at myself. So the budget we have of 3 billion Swedish kroner, how much of that is funding innovations that helps? And are we funding innovations that don't help? So uh, let me give you an example. Of course, we fund innovation that is important for industry, you know, reducing optimization, it's uh, optimizing production, uh, reducing uh, the need for raw materials, all of that, which in a way is good. Well, it's more sustainable <laughs> to reduce waste than not. Um, but if you put it in a business model that's still based on consuming more, it's actually just you know making it cheaper to make the problem bigger in the big picture. So I think that it's important for us to also be part and actively a part in the dialogue saying, okay, let's do this. How do we make sure that the bigger picture where it's implemented is actually driving this switch to a circular system, for instance. And are we then prioritizing our money in a way that's promoting the other parts that are necessary? You know, a circular economy doesn't come by itself. So again, I didn't just point to the world. I need to also look at myself and the budgets that we're responsible for because it's taxpayers' money. We need to invest it in the future. It's important. Thank you. David. Um, we've been talking very specifically about innovation 
to solve problems that are emerging. Uh, but I keep thinking as I'm listening that the structures for communication, consultation, for connecting people from different sectors would also be crucial in addressing crises. Um, I'm thinking of recent crises that we've all experienced, pandemic. Now, of course, something you mentioned earlier in conversation today, the question of, of Sweden, Sweden's role with, with NATO. And I understand that we've been talking about innovation, but it, it's hard for, for me not to think of the advantages to political life that come with the habit of consultation and actually the forward-looking that you've been talking about. Can you reflect a little bit about innovation systems in times of crisis? The question is about innovation systems in times of crisis, uh, like invasions and other things. <laughs> invasion, okay. I can start with pandemics. Sounds good. <laughs> Let's go with that one. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I mean, first of all, there's a lot that we can all, I'm sure that we've learned a lot during the pandemic. So a few reflections were uh, pretty uh, early on. Um, first of all, the pandemic is a testament to the value of long-term commitment to research and innovation. The reason why we could have vaccines, etc., are because of earlier investments, right, that build this capacity. So, lesson number one, let's continue <laughs> to make research and innovation a priority. Um, lesson number two, though, was that large-scale change in a very short time is possible. When the pandemic hit, everyone made some really tough priorities and changes as individuals, as organizations, as nations, all over the place. So we were capable as a, you know, the global community to actually act together in the face of this very urgent and acute crisis and made, made major differences. And I think that's actually a hopeful message. Like we, we can make big changes in priorities and behavior, et cetera, fast when we um, even though we don't necessarily always do it. And then it will be interesting to see the follow-up research. So for instance, we opened up a call uh, for those just to, to help stimulate uh, fast changes that could help m handle some of the immediate problems with the pandemic. So in that call, we just said, if you have an innovation idea and you can connect it to the one with the need and you both agree about this, here's the call. <laughs> And we ended up with a portfolio of vastly different uh, things, like uh, a, a beautifully made outdoors, not a church, what do you call it? My English is not good enough now. Uh, Capel, like a small thing, chapel. A, a yeah. chapel. That would be. So that was really for you know the human relations part. That was a beautiful thing. And at the same time, we ended up funding a company that switched from producing uh, filters for vacuum cleaner to <laughs> producing face masks in a few weeks. <laughs> So I think, and I would like to see some follow-up research on that, like what, kind, what, what was typical for the organizations capable of making the switch in terms of, and then of course my idea and my presumption would be that if you already have a culture of innovation where you need, you need to work on different horizons, you need to work on the immediate and the midterm and the long term, and even the possible future, the fourth horizon if you talk about horizon scanning, right? So if you are trained, and aware of those and your ability to prioritize that, I think it's easier. If you have a culture of solving problems, if you have a culture of listening to the ideas regardless of where they come from, et cetera, et cetera, taking risk, then it's easier to make these decisions. But you know, it would be interesting to see, actually. Um, but then obviously, to, to your question, David, also another reflection on crisis, there is a difference between crisis and regular times. So one thing that does happen in crisis typically is that we do mobilize in another way. We are prepared to act uh, together and make you know, uncomfortable things because we feel the necessity. And it can't be directly translated to everyday life, unfortunately, in a way. Uh, but I think it's very valuable. I don't know, from your perspective, everything we learned. So let's go to the habits, for instance. We're not traveling the way we used to. Uh, let's just not go back to. I will never again fly to Brussels for a day meeting. It just makes zero sense. So. Those were a few reflections, but I kind of didn't say anything about the invasion crisis. We don't have it. Um, but I think, in terms of consultation, then, if I would say that Sweden has a long history of being a neutral country, 
uh, a very long history. We haven't been in war for 300 years. Um, it's not about, from my perspective, I can't speak for government, just so you know. If there's a, uh, it's not about not taking sides. We're sending defensive weapons to Ukraine. It has to do with more of a, what is the position that is the best for uh, safeguarding Sweden, and there's a very active debate on that, and I think that there will be both consultations and all kinds of uh, uh, processes in place. And we have elections coming up next fall, so <laughs> we'll see how it okay. plays out. Yeah. Uh, other questions from the audience? Yes, one more question. Yeah, I'm curious about your, your relationship with your the Scandinavian neighbors, and I'm thinking in particular like Norway, with its, uh, you know, huge sovereign wealth fund kind of been funded by fossil fuels and stuff, yet they're very progressive in electrifying their, their transportation stuff like that. Are you, are you working with them to try to, I mean, what is their exit strategy? What's Norway's exit strategy from their fossil fuel dependence? Thinking about the headlines I saw recently, let me just, I don't know, we're not working with them on their exit strategy, uh, but we're definitely collaborating with them on many, many things. Um, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say. One area where we are collaborating right now more than ever is in terms of advanced, uh, advanced production of uh, vaccines and, uh, in the life sciences, for instance, um, and also with Finland. And we have a lot of collaborations with all the Nordic countries. Uh, but definitely in the, after the pandemic, we have intensified uh, work collaborations in research and innovation in life science and production. Of. But on the exit strategy, I don't know if our government is doing that. We're not. Probably, yeah. Well, we won't we have a very different we'll situation have to invite in Sweden. Norwegian. Yeah, you'll we'll have to invite the Norwegians. But we also in Sweden, we have a very different situation. We, uh, we have goals to become the first fossil-free welfare nation in the world, and uh, it's not an impossible goal to reach, uh, in part because we do have a lot of clean energy and uh, different, different situations. Well, you've given us a lot to think about tonight, and um, one of the things I to, to sort of try to wrap it up, I, I was really intrigued a moment ago you were speaking about um, thinking about uh, planning in the near term, the medium term, the long term, the fourth horizon into the future and telling stories. And it is, I agree, it is a, a strength of the humanities, um, you know, to, to look back over time and see how human societies have um, transited through these crises at different times. It gives us this uh, deep perspective. So very much appreciate both your perspective on uh, building the capacities of all the people in your society. It's something that we very much value here too as well. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, strength in our societies and, and we sort of do best, I think, when we look to building those capacities across the whole uh, society. And, and um, we can tell those stories effectively. So uh, I look forward to the stories that you and your organization are going to tell, and um, uh, perhaps someday we'll uh, see you in Sweden. Let's have a round of applause for our guests.